it's it's a really interesting case study to look at the derivatives in the system, how leveraged the system is. And you know, just this this small move in a currency pair that most people have never even thought about trading. I mean, it, it brought down brokers. FXCM, one of the biggest brokers in the world, had to, you know that they, they they were out of pocket for over two hundred million dollars because of this event. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for August twenty first through August twenty eighth, twenty twenty three, while supplies last. This week we feature silver buffalo rounds and 10 ounce silver Asahi bars, both at just $2.50 over spot. The silver buffalo is made by various private mints across the US, with the design based on James Earl Fraser's iconic buffalo nickel. They are highly recognizable and one of the most trusted types of bullion rounds available. These 3 9 fine rounds come 20 to a tube and 500 to a box. And at just $2.50 over spot, they offer unparalleled liquidity at a price lower than many high-volume bars. Next, the Asahi Refinery continues the legacy of famed private mint Johnson Mathy, which they purchased in 2015, and refined with the same attention to detail, cementing their status as an LBMA-certified supplier. Their 10-ounce bars are 3 nines fine and on sale for just $2.50 over spot per ounce. They are also IRA-eligible. If you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're glad to have a first time visitor today, Sam Laurie, who is a good close working associate with our good friend, John Adams from adamseconomics.com and soon to be Adams Bullion. We'll be talking about that in just a minute. Is joining us this first time on Liberty and Finance. Sam, thanks for coming on to our channel for this very first time. Thanks for having me, Donegan. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be speaking with you today. We're recording this on Friday, August 18th in the US and Saturday, August 19th in Australia, where you're based. I'm letting everyone know that Sam has been working in the financial services sector for over five years, doing algorithmic trading, over-the-counter derivatives, equities trading, and bullion dealing before starting the uh, startup of Adams Bullion with our good friend, John Adams. So, Sam, we wanted to talk with you first since you've been involved in the financial sector and seen several aspects of that in your uh, more than half a decade, whether you have been watching more closely than others things that are causing you to think, you know, people should be p paying closer attention to these events that are happening than they probably are, certainly more closely than they're being told to by mainstream uh, financial press. One example of that that you and I were just discussing was the flash crash of the Swiss National Bank and uh, that basically almost took down uh, who knows how much of the financial sector. And could you tell people about what happened, when it happened, and what was the direction that that was heading and what it tells us about how quickly things can change in the stability of the financial sector, just in case they might be thinking all is well at the moment? Absolutely, Dunnigan. So that's, yes, something I wanted to speak about today um, briefly, of course, is the Swiss National Bank's flash crash of 2015. So that was back on the 15th of January of 2015. Um, long story short, the Swiss National Bank, they had a peg against the euro. They were defending the peg, um, you know, manipulated currencies. I think lots of bullion people can understand that. Um, but one day out of nowhere, I mean, days before they said they'd defend it, and then one day out of nowhere, they just withdrew the peg. Doesn't seem like a big deal. Um, but for currency traders, it was probably the biggest deal of their life. So what I mean by that is this, the, the currency pair, the Euro CHF, the Euro against the Swiss franc, it crashed by 40% in a matter of five minutes. Um, now, if you've ever traded Forex before, you'd understand that a 1% move in a day is a huge move. That's what Forex traders look for. So 40%, it blew a lot of people out of the market. Now, something that was really interesting as well about this event was the lack of liquidity. So more so than just the price move, which was absolutely incredible, it's considered a black swan event, you know, unforeseen. Um, but more than just the price move was the lack of liquidity. So, you know, you've mentioned my past. I've, I, I am a trader. I've been trading for years. And, you know, when you talk to traders about what this event meant for them, 
you know, traders who normally they'd, they'd risk 1% of their account on the trade, you know, typical risk management in trading, um, their stop losses couldn't get filled. There was no liquidity. So, you know, say they planned to risk $1,000 on this trade. Um, and then, of course, you know, this, this flash crash happens and, and then their whole, their whole account's gone and maybe they owe their broker some money as well. Um, so there, there was a huge fallout from this event too. Um, you know, lots of, lots of individual traders lost a lot of money, but a lot of brokers did go down as well. Um, two major ones, one in New Zealand, one in the UK. Um, Alpari was the one in the UK. Um, so, you know, from a counterparty risk perspective, which again, bullion people can understand the idea that, you know, if you, if you don't hold it, you don't really own it. Um, you know, dealing with these brokers and taking on the counterparty risk of, you know, doing business with somebody that might go down. Again, very interesting to look at. So there's a few things to, to, to kind of glean from that event. Um, first of all is, you know, the, the, the highly leveraged nature of the system where, you know, people trading currency. I mean, here in Australia, you know, you can trade currency with, with 30 to 1 leverage. It used to be a lot more. You used to be able to trade it with up to 500 to 1 leverage. Back in 2015, you could. Um, so, again, it's it's a really interesting case study to look at the derivatives in the system, how leveraged the system is, and, you know, just this this small move in a currency pair that most people have never even thought about trading, I mean, it, it brought down brokers. FXCM, one of the biggest brokers in the world, had to, you know, that they, they, they were out of pocket for over $200 million because of this event. So, huge. And again, something that most, most bullion stackers that I talk to at least, they, they, they haven't heard about this event, which traders remember it very well. Before we get into further what the implications are of such a black swan event, I wanted to clarify one thing, if we could, for some of our uh, viewers who may not be familiar with uh, markets and how they trade. One of the things that you mentioned was a stop loss order and money management. Anybody who is involved in trading needs to be careful to manage their cash so that they don't lose it all or too much in a single bet, a single trade on the market. And one of the, the techniques that is used for that is called a stop loss order, where if you buy, whether it's a stock or an equity or a, or a, or a a derivative such as an option or something at a certain price point, you'd perhaps be happy if it were to go up because that might make you money, but you'd be concerned about getting out quickly if it goes down too much. And so for people who place a stop loss order slightly below some, some threshold, whether it was where they bought in at or the previous day's low or whatever, some moving average, they'll put a stop loss that if the, if the uh, instrument that they've invested in or are speculating in uh, trades below a certain trigger point called the, the stop loss level, then their order would be immediately uh, submitted to the market. But the problem is in the cases like this, if the market moves too quickly, it could have passed well beyond where they were comfortable, uh, where they thought they had limited their risk. And in fact, there's really uh, unlimited in the sense that they could lose it all if it goes too far down without a bid. If there's any clarifications you want to add to that, but the, the point that I was bringing up was even when you think you're being responsible, even when you think you're taking the reasonable, normal, and customary actions to ensure limited losses and limited risk on your part, the market uh, doesn't care what you think is limited or, or normal. Uh, or within your budget, uh, you can be subject to much greater losses potentially than you think you are. We've given our audience a lot of examples of that recently. Uh, most recent uh, with the interview we just did with Andy Sheckman earlier this week about things that are threats to your retirement. But could you maybe zoom in on any of the other aspects of this kind of a, a sudden event that can blindside people and really put them at much greater risk than they thought they were at? Yes. Yeah, so you, look, you, you're absolutely right there about everything you've just said, stop losses, et cetera. People, you know, doing the right thing, following the right trading plans and risk management plans and, you know, expecting to risk 1% on this trade and everything. And then of course, it, not only can they lose everything, like you've just said, they can lose more than everything. They can owe their broken money, which is again, the issue that, that happened with the, uh, the Swiss national bank crash. I mean, I remember talking to traders, you know, in my algorithmic trading role who, who traded during that event and they said, you know, not only did it, blow my entire account when I was only expecting to risk 1%, I ended up owing the broker, you know, $50,000, $100,000. And then you've got to find that from somewhere. Maybe you've got to, you know, sell a car, sell a property, you know, sell some investments. It's, 
not a fun time. And again, this is going into this, just like you've said, you've expected to risk 1% on this trade of your account. You know, maybe you expected to risk a thousand dollars and then your entire hundred thousand dollar account's gone and you need to sell a car. You know, it's, it's black swan, as I said earlier. So it's, it's something that people should be aware of. Like you were saying earlier, things, risks that people should be aware of. And it, it is, it is something very rare. These events don't happen every day, but they do happen. The other aspect of that that I think you were getting into near the end there was talking about how it's not was not only a risk to people's trading accounts who are active traders, but it was also a systemic, potentially a systemic risk to the financial system. Uh, how did that get resolved? And did, did some other, you said it, it dropped 40% in five minutes or something like that. Uh, what was there some action taken by officials to somehow stop the bleeding and turn things around, uh, you know, in response to that crisis? So great question. So in terms of actions from officials, there, there wasn't, there wasn't really much. It, it all happened very quickly. You know, within, within an hour or two after the, 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 you know, the announcement, everything was kind of over. The dust had settled. Um, but there were, there were certain, um, actions taken by brokers, FXCM in particular. Um, you know, the main broker that, that we talk about here. Um, they had circuit breakers, um, on, on their clients. So not everybody's. Positions would have gotten filled at lower prices. They, they had risk management techniques. They did a really good job. I've got to say FXCM did a really good job of making sure that their clients got the best, um, execution that they can on their trades, uh, you know, in, in that sort of event. So there were actions taken. Um, even so FXCM still did lose over $200 million from the event and they've written quite a scathing article about it. Um, really criticizing the actions of the Swiss National Bank, because that's something to, to, to remember here as well, is that this currency peg, the Swiss National Bank, up until you know, days before this announcement of withdrawing the peg, they were telling the market that they were going to maintain that peg continuously. So if you look at it from a trader's perspective, you know, on, 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 on a couple of days before, the Swiss National Bank is saying, we're going to defend the peg. And from a trader's perspective, if it goes down to where the peg is, and you buy it, and they say we're going to defend it, and then it jumps back up again, it's almost a no-brainer trade. It's you know, it's it's very very attractive as a trade. You know, with the Swiss National Bank behind you, you think how can I lose? The answer is if the Swiss National Bank is lying to you about whether they're behind you or not, and that's something to think about as well. Central banks around the world, they say a lot of things, but how many of them are true? That's on the minds of a lot of people in the U.S., especially this last three or four months since we've had a rash of bank failures, not insignificant bank failures. The second, third, and fourth largest bank failures ever in the United States happened just three months ago, as well as uh, Credit Suisse Bank, a major bank in Switzerland, uh, and a key systemically important bank in the Euro region. So a lot of the talk that had happened since then, including testimony before Congress by Janet Yellen, the head of the, uh, the uh, FDIC and so on, talking about what is going to be the action to protect ordinary savers and, and banks, especially smaller uh, regional or community banks, in the case of further upsets and further runs on the banking system. And this comes on the tail of a leaked video from meetings at the FDIC within the last nine months or so, where the discussions turned to the inevitability of upcoming bank runs and the importance of not telling the public about it in advance so that it wouldn't have unintended consequences of fomenting a bank run, but letting knowing that that is going to be coming, it is going to be happening. There's even been talk about whether all of this is part of a master plan to basically cull small banks up to the too big to fail banks and perhaps then all the way up to the treasury or the Fed itself. And there's been significant talks. Lael Brainerd, one of the advisors to the Biden administration, uh, talking about that we should get rid of all of these uh, individual banks and then just have the Fed run the whole show, just a central bank to run it all, one one bank to rule them all. But uh, before we get onto that a little bit more deeply, I wanted to get back on one of the, the implications that you discussed with me um, much prior to setting up this interview, and that's that people have no idea on the main of how quickly something as small as this could was, was causing a major disruption in uh, Forex trading markets. What would happen if a major event happened? Uh, and what would the effect be? How widespread could that contagion spread across the system? Your further thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's something to, to, to really consider here. I mean, you know, this is the Swiss National Bank that we're talking about. This isn't 
the Federal Reserve. This isn't even the European Central Bank. This is a, you know, Switzerland's not a big country. You know, yes, they've got a, a, a famous banking system, but it's not, it's not a huge market that we're talking about here. So, you know, with a, with a minor central bank like that, just withdrawing a currency peg and, you know, seeing the, the market turmoil that results from such an event, you know, it, 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 it begs the question, you know, if a larger central bank, you know, the Federal Reserve, the ECB, were to do something similar, you know, go back on what they're saying, you know, something like that, then the market turmoil could be significantly larger. And some, something I'd, I'd, I'd quickly like to touch on as well, something you said earlier there about, you know, these these bank values in the US, you know, Signature, we've seen all these banks, Credit Suisse, you know, I, I'm not necessarily a, a a really old market participant, but I've seen multiple once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime events in my career. You know, multiple uh, globally significant investment banks failing. You know, Bear Stearns back in two thousand eight. Now Credit Suisse today. There's, it's a highly leveraged system we live in. The 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 derivatives. I mean, it's it's incredible. It blows the mind. You know, it, it's it's a house of cards. Is essentially what I'm getting at there, the leverage that people trade with. Uh, and, and going back to the, the US banking system, the duration on, on the, 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 these banks' balance sheets, you know, they've locked in all these low yielding investments, treasury bonds, you know, mortgages with very thick, low fixed rates. And then they have to give their depositors these increasing rates of interest to attract their deposits or they lose their deposits and then they have to pay them out. So, they're, they're, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. The Federal Reserve's in a corner between inflation and, and you know, interest rates and debt. It really makes you wonder as to the long-term sustainability of such a system. Yeah, the, the counterparty risk that most people are exposed to, they have no idea, I believe, because we have uh, Rick Rule, who's a frequent visitor on, on our platform, talks to us about the currently less than one half of 1% of all investments in the US are in either precious metals or precious metals related equities, such as mining stocks, et cetera. So that means 99.5% of investments are not uh, protected from the main uh, derivative based or fiat based or stock-based and bond-based uh, investing that most people are exposed to. And you just scratched the surface of one historical example that wasn't that long ago of the Swiss National Bank's uh, co you know, convulsions of the, the, the trading ratio between that and the euro. There are other things that have happened like that that have been potentially um, existential upsets to this house of cards and most people think no 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 i've got my savings in the bank or i've got i've got my financial planner taking care of things and and the market always tends to recover and you just write out the dips that's been proven for 40 years i'm going to stick with the trend what trends are you seeing developing that give you pause or give you concern and you think most people should look at more closely isn't that a great question so in terms of in terms of trends that I, that i'm or should i say um, market market unfolding i'm looking at first of all evergrande at the moment i mean that's that's the most recent news out of the market evergrande's finally filed bankruptcy we've been talking well, people have been talking on your channel about evergrande for years you know going back all the way to 2020 2021 i've been watching them for years so that's that's a market um event that I'm watching unfold and I think people should be watching as well very closely. China is a major, major part of the global economy, increasingly so, and this is a huge part of their economy, real estate. I mean, real estate is what brought down the US in 2008. It should not be uh, overlooked, particularly in an economy as big as China. So that's something I'm watching unfold. But prior to that, I mean, only a week ago, we were all watching the Bank of Japan, you know, unwinding their yield curve control policy, raising interest rates again, despite the fact that they're over 200% of their annual GDP in national debt. You know, I, I look at that and I think, Japan, you can't do it. You can't pay this debt. You can't raise rates to fight inflation. You are too far gone. And that leads to a question of, well, how does that end up? Beyond that, Japan raising their interest rates and, you know, backing off this yield curve control policy. There's also the, in financial services, particularly currency trading, there's something called a, a carry trade, 
Now, a carry trade is where you buy one currency and you sell another currency to benefit from the interest rate differential between the two. So with the US raising their interest rates and Japan keeping theirs low, there is a real opportunity for a carry trade to jump into that trade and collect the difference between those two interest rates. Now, as that difference winds back, a lot of people will be jumping out of the carry trade and that has a huge knock-on effect for US financial markets. Japan holds, the, you know, outside of the US, of course, they're the largest US treasury holder in the world. So when you talk about the Bank of Japan, it's not some, you know, small little country that doesn't matter here. It's a, it's, it's a global economy and it's very important. So, you know, watching these things unfold in China, in Japan, you know, watching the Eurozone and you know, the, the, the problems they're having as well. I mean, it seems like, it's hard to find a country that's not having issues at the moment. Another thing is, like as you're mentioning Japan, there's two parts about that I think that are additionally noteworthy. Uh, you talked about their, they had previously announced and tried to defend a 0% uh, interest rate. Then they retreated from that, it was a quarter percent, to retreated that to half a percent, I believe. And now just un uh, unwinding that that stance that, that many people had said is was untenable from the beginning, un unable to really defend that given the, the huge debt posture that, and the huge ownership of the of their uh, company's debt that, that their central bank has. However, the US is following following like a little puppy dog behind Japan for about just about a decade and a half behind them, but we've been following the same policies, the same playbook. And if we're saying Japan is too far gone, then what what lies ahead for the US is number one. Number two, I recall back a few decades ago when there were, or even less, when there were major concerns at various US Treasury bond auctions, who's going to step up and be the buyer, that it was various unlikely suspects that would show up at the last minute and buy up the US Treasury debt. Japan was one of them on multiple occasions that, that saved the day for the US Treasury auctions. And now if Japan's in such dire straits, who's going to save the day for the US Treasury going forward? So if people say, oh, why do I care what's going on in Japan? Well, we're following the same playbook and they used to so-called, you know, save the day for us when we got in trouble. Your thoughts on the roles, these, the, the interconnectedness between countries where a problem w in one place can be boom, immediately cause contagion around the world. Absolutely, absolutely. So you, you, you've hit the nail on the head there about the interconnectedness of the system. You know, I, I, I think about long-term capital management back in the 90s where, you know, a, a Russian bond failure meant the, the almost collapse of a, of a New York, you know, hedge fund and, and the – the knock-on effects for the New York market. I mean, you know, the smallest things happening halfway across the world can can bring down markets in your country. So, you know, thinking about the global aspects of of the markets is is very important. Um, I think what you've said there about about the Japanese, it's absolutely true. If you want to have a look at your future as a you know a Western Keynesian economy, the Japanese are where you are headed. You know, if if you look at the US and, and how your jet debt to GDP ratio has been growing over the last few years in particular, you will one day end up like Japan. Um, and that's, it, it does seem like that's the playbook for the, for the Western world. So keep an eye on Japan because that's, that's where we're headed. And, and lastly, just to, just to again, touch on something you said there about Japan defending its, you know, its, well, defending low interest rates with yield curve control. I mean, only a month or two ago, they were saying that we will print an unlimited amount of Japanese yen to buy up these government bonds and you know we're going to defend these low interest rates with any means necessary and you know as a as a stacker as a trader you know I, I hear that and I think man who would hold the yen you know hearing I oh, will print an unlimited amount I just think wow that's you know that's that's crazy talk and in the same breath that people realize that that's being done by uh, other Western fiat-based central banks, uh, they still have the, uh, the normalcy bias to think that the king dollar will be the king dollar forever. And yet again, we're on the same path, we're fo following the same playbook. And we've already seen uh, some people, depending whose numbers you look at, 98 to 99% loss in purchasing power of the dollar since the formation of the Fed in 1913. That kind of brings us to, well, what is a person to do? How do you quit holding something that is inevitably doomed 
to lose value and losing it at an accelerating rate? One of the answers that keeps being brought forward is precious metals, for example, gold and silver or productive farmland. There's very few other assets, but none as universally recognized as portable, liquid, et cetera, as precious metals. You have just gone into a partnership with John Adams, our good friend and frequent visitor here, to form Adams Bullion. Can you let people know I guess what Adams Bullion's mission is and what your part is in, in that new venture. Yeah, absolutely. So Adams Bullion, um, it's a new venture by John and I. So what we set out to be is Australia's most politically active bullion dealer. So with everything that's John doing that John's doing, sorry, you know, he defeated the cash ban back in 2020 when our Australian government tried to make any transaction in cash over ten thousand dollars illegal and punishable by jail. So he fought that. He fought for our financial freedoms, our civil liberties, um, and he's continuing the fight moving forward. So that's kind of our, our point of difference there is that we're Australia's most politically active bullion dealer. If you'd like to do business with somebody that is actively fighting for your civil liberties here in Australia, then we're the obvious choice. Um, of course, there's other reasons to do business with us as well, competitive pricing, product range, et cetera. Um, but that's our real point of difference there is that we are political, we are active, and we are fighting for your freedoms. You know, we're not just selling you protection, we're also actively trying to make Australia a better place. Um, but it, it is something that we're incredibly proud to do together. You know, both of us are, are big stackers ourselves, you know, we've been, been investing in this space and, you know, in, in metals for years and years. So, you know, offering something that, that we obviously both invest in ourselves, it's it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's a dream come true to work with somebody like John for myself. Yeah. And if people want to find out more about Adam's Bullion, where should they go? Yeah, so um, hop on our website, Adams Bullion, uh, so adamsbullion.com, um, and you can find more information about us there. You can have a look at our product range, et cetera. And if you'd like to reach out, um, our contact information is on the website. Um, so feel free to send through an email. I'll be more than happy to have a chat with you. Sam, it's been a pleasure for this first visit. Uh, I think our viewers will resonate with a lot of your concerns, a lot of your observations. And we're all watching the same thing. And frankly, uh, even though you mentioned John and uh, Adam's Bullion being advocates for the good of the Australian people, and we're grateful for that, his voice is heard here again on our channel and others within the US and in Europe. So he is a, a rallying point and a, a, uh, a ardent and tireless uh, voice for the good of the people everywhere. And so what he has to say about and, and you even mentioned in your uh, explanation and introduction to me about your admiration of the U.S. Constitution and Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, that sort of thing. Uh, John has as well, and he's argued for, uh, you know, British uh, common law and how Australia needs to uh, stand up and do the right thing, even if it goes against current statutes in, in, in Australia, because those statutes may be immoral. They may be against, against uh, common law, against common sense and against the good of the people, which brings me back to one last point, and that is uh, the tagline of this talk that I gave at a recent uh, Rick Rules uh, Symposium on Natural Resource Investing in Boca Raton, Florida, was it's what you're not being told that can hurt you. And you mentioned that several times describing that what we're hearing from officialdom, whether it's the Bank of uh, Switzerland, whether it's the Bank of Japan, whether it's whoever we're hearing from officialdom is often quite the opposite of what's actually about to happen. So people, you already know that. <laughs> Andy Sheckman says, trust your gut. And this is a time for that because if you are going based on what you're being told by official sources, you're probably not being told something and that will hurt you. So uh, we're very grateful for your presence here, Sam, and joining us this first time on Liberty and Finance. Absolutely. Well, it's been a pleasure to be here, Dunnigan. Again, I appreciate having you on. It's, it's been fantastic having a chat. And yes, despite the fact that obviously John and I are based here in Australia and we're fighting here in Australia, you know, Australians, we, we, we love America. We watch a lot of your content, a lot of Australian stackers watch yourself, other American YouTubers as well. So, you know, it's, it, we're in the fight together, Americans and Australians. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. See you again. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, 
and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.